Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Pastors years ago used to be called gospel preachers, and nowadays they often call them Bible teachers. I'm not opposed to the term Bible teacher, but there's something about that old title, a gospel preacher, and uh, preaching the gospel, the word of God. That's what the Apostle Paul said in this section of Scripture that we looked at, verse 1, where it says, we have this ministry. Remember I told you to mo- notice those two words there, this ministry is referencing the gospel ministry. This is a ministry that we all have. It's not unique just to a pastor. Uh, each and every one of us have this. I wish I knew what my ministry was, preacher. I wish I, I knew what God's will was for my life. Uh, this is your ministry. This ministry is a gospel ministry that we have. Paul made the gospel of Christ the center and the central focal point of his preaching. And if we as a Christian are to make gospel preaching or gospel a part of our life, then Christ will also need to be that central center figure of our lives, everything revolving. And this is why our life gets so out of balance. Uh, we try to put God in our life as one spoke of many spokes of our life. You've got family and recreation and work and God and, you know, all these other things. And, and then we put ourselves at the center of the hub of the wheel and we wonder why our life is so out of balance. We wonder why our life is running so roughly. And it's because the center, the hub, the focal point of our lives has to be Christ. It has to be Lord Jesus Christ. And every area of our life, the spokes of our life, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of things that goes on in our life. Uh, but it has to be focused upon Christ. And when that focus is right, then the balance of our life is going to run much more smoothly. And uh, you'll have much more enjoyment of life. And that was the focal point of Paul's ministry was a central focus of Christ, the gospel of Christ in his preaching. Uh, He continually preached on the crucifixion of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, and those two being integral parts working hand in hand uh, with each other. Paul also refers to this gospel as the glorious gospel of Christ. Uh, The word glorious means worthy of great honor, worthy of praise, worthy of much uh, exaltation. So the gospel cannot be downplayed, it cannot be minimized, it cannot be put on the back burner. Uh, It's a glorious gospel, it's worthy to be praised, it's worthy to be elevated, it's worthy to be honored in each of our life. And the central message of the Bible uh, should be the central message of our preaching, which is the glorious gospel of Christ. But I want you to notice this little phrase that Paul says here, he says, if our gospel be hid. Now what, what is the gospel? Uh, The gospel is the most wonderful message uh, that a world in hopelessness needs if they're ever to find hope in their life. It's the life, the the sinless life, uh, the vicarious death, meaning he dying in our place, and that glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is. Uh, The word gospel means good news. And uh, so when you're sharing the gospel, you're sharing good news. Uh, We don't have to apologize for sharing good news. You don't have to uh, feel bad about sharing good news. You don't have to uh, feel like you're infringing upon someone's right because you're sharing good news. I mean, you got some good news to share. And it'd be like someone's showing up at your door and and, uh, some sweepstakes, you know, uh, sweepstake winner, and they show up and uh, they're not ashamed or embarrassed or bashful to share with you. You may not be interested at first, but they've got some good news for you. If you would just allow them to speak a little bit, you say, wow, that's some great news. I'm a winner. I've won this. And uh, we've got something much, much more valuable and precious uh, to the needs of men, mankind, to men, uh, as the gospel of Jesus Christ, more than what the world can offer. And so he says, if our gospel, uh, being that wonderful message of salvation, the source of the gospel of God and the person of the gospel is Jesus Christ. That good news about God sending Jesus to this world uh, to die in our place, to suffer our hell and to be our savior. John 3, 16 epitomizes the gospel for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not 
perish, but have everlasting. That's the gospel uh, in one verse, in a nutshell, that God reveals to us. The gospel is God uh, spelling out His love uh, in us in Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's not just a lovely story, the gospel. It's a declaration of a fact. A historical fact that God was not was giving upon His Son that which we deserve, and He suffered my hell. He paid my sin debt. Uh, he suffered my consequence of sin, and uh, allowed me to obtain forgiveness of sins. The wonderful, God, glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is not good advice uh, about how to to uh, to be saved. Uh, it's the good news about what God has already done for us in Christ so that we can be saved. There's nothing that I have to do. Here's the advice of what you need to do to get saved. Go to church and turn over a new leaf and, and uh, all this kind of stuff. No, the gospel is a message that's already been done. The transaction is done when Christ died on the cross. What do you say? It's finished. It is finished. And when he says it is finished, then that means there's nothing else that needs to be done. The transaction is done. The satisfaction of God has been satisfied. Everything is forgiven when you come to Christ as your personal Savior. So it's not just good advice. It's a wonder of God's love for us. The gospel is summed up in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 where it says it's a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom Paul says... I'm chief. And he said, I'm the worst of sinners, but that's the gospel. He came to save me, and he came to save you. And aren't you glad for the gospel message of salvation that has brought to us that glorious gospel where God commends his love towards us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's the good news of the gospel. But Paul says, if our gospel be hid. Now, this is a remarkable statement that Paul makes here. He calls the gospel our gospel. We understand the gospel is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We understand that. But Paul says this is our gospel. And in another verse of Scripture, in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, he declares that it's my gospel. Romans 2, 16 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men uh, by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so then, in what sense is the gospel our gospel? And in what sense, we didn't die on the cross, uh, we didn't you know, uh, suffer that sin debt. Uh, what, is it, what, what essence is it of, uh, of my gospel? I did nothing a part of the gospel. It's all Christ. But Paul said it's our gospel. He said it's my gospel. And so how does that apply? In what sense is the gospel our gospel? I think the first thing that we can look at about the reason that it's our gospel is because we've heard it. There's been millions that have never heard the gospel message of salvation. We live in a country where we probably have heard it time after time after time after time. We've heard it many times, much more than just one time. But there's many untold that have never heard the message of the gospel, the glorious gospel message that Christ loves them and died for them and wants them to go to heaven. And that's why we support missionaries around the world to be able to go to people who have never heard the story, have never heard the message of salvation, and have never been exposed to the love of God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God, and that God wants to forgive them in their sins and save them from hell and give them a home in heaven. They've never heard that story. And so it's our gospel. Why? We've heard it. We've heard the message of the gospel story. They've not heard it. Uh, they maybe have heard about religion, but they've never heard the gospel story. They've not heard that God has done everything that is necessary for their acceptance uh, in the sight of God. You see, there's nothing that I have to do uh, to gain favor with God. Christ has already done that for us. There's nothing I could do to merit my goodness before God. That's already been done through Jesus Christ. Christ is the one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus. You don't get to God through your good works. You don't get to God through being a Baptist. You don't get to God through some denominational background. You get to God one way. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is that way. So how is it our gospel? Number one, I think it's our gospel because we have heard the gospel. I think secondly, uh, uh, we see that it's our gospel because we've received the gospel. Not only have we heard the gospel, but we've also received the gospel. Look back in uh, verse number 1 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at the Bible says in verse 1, Therefore, 
seeing we have this ministry, have notice how we've what? Received mercy. We've received mercy and faint not. Not only have we heard the gospel, but we've received the gospel. You see, the gospel is not something that, salvation is not something that we give. Uh, it's not something uh, uh, that you have to offer. That's why if someone says uh, in an invitation, sometimes you'll hear the church, it's not biblical, but you'll hear this. They'll say, why don't you come and give your life to Christ in salvation? Come give your life to Christ. Listen, that's not salvation. What do I have to offer Him? What can I give to Him? Salvation is receiving, but as many as received Him, to them give me power to become the sons of God, I become a child of God. Not by giving my life to Christ, I become a child of God by receiving that gift of salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's what? It's a gift of God. And that gift of God must be received. You can't force a gift on someone. You can't buy a gift. It's something that someone purchases for you. They wrap it up for you. They give it to you. And all you do is receive that gift. And so the gospel, you've heard it. How shall they hear without a preacher? But then we also, those many of us today, we've received the gospel. We know Christ is our Savior. You know your sins are forgiven. You know you're a child of God. You can look back to a time and a place, not when you joined a church, and not when you turned over a new leaf, and not when you're confirmed, and not when you're baptized, but you look back to a place in your life where you trusted Christ as your Savior, and you can say, I know I'm a child of God. I've received the gift of salvation. Now, there may be some of you here today, you've never received that gift of salvation. You've heard the gospel. You maybe have come to church now for quite some time. You've heard the message of the gospel over and over again, but you've yet to receive the gospel. The Bible says if you're going to go to heaven, you've got to receive. Why? That's an act of your will. That's a choosing on your part. No one forces you. Nobody manipulates you. Nobody manhandles you. The offer is given. The invitation is given. The message is proclaimed. And you by faith receive it by faith, accepting Christ as your Savior, you receive that gift. And so maybe today some of you have never received. And what better day than today on Pastor Appreciation Day, amen? Well, that would be the greatest gift uh, that I could give as someone coming to know Christ as their Savior on this Sunday. So we've heard it. That's why it's our gospel. We've received it. That's why it's our gospel. But we also have been entrusted with it. That's why it's our gospel. Take your Bibles and go to, we'll come back here in Corinthians in a moment, but go to Galatians, if you would, please, chapter number two. Galatians chapter two, it's interesting to me that Paul, in referencing the gospel, would say, it's our gospel. It's my gospel. Wait a minute. It's not our gospel. It's not my gospel. The gospel is focused on Christ. He is the death, the burial, the resurrection. That's what the gospel is. But Paul says, no, uh, it's our gospel. Why? Because you've heard it. You've received it. And also because God has entrusted us with the gospel. Paul speaks about the gospel being committed to him. I look what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now the words are uncircumcision and circumcision is referencing the Gentile and the Jews. The Jews were uh, circumcised. The uh, Gentiles were uncircumcised. That, that's where that correlation goes. So Paul said uh, they were, uh, saw that the gospel of the Gentiles, all right, he's saying, the gospel, Paul says, of the Gentiles was what? Committed. It was entrusted. It was given to me uh, as, uh, as the gospel uh, uh, to the Jews was given unto who? Peter. So Peter's emphasis was reaching the Jews. Paul's primary emphasis was reaching the Gentiles and the gospel being the center point. But Paul says the, the gospel message unto the Gentiles, it was committed unto me. It was entrusted unto me. It was something that I now have become accountable for. It's not mine in the sense of I own it, but it's mine in the sense I'm now responsible for how well I take care of as a steward as a manager, as an overseer of that which has been entrusted. Let me give you another verse, entrusted to me. Go to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, we also see this same uh, thought given. Uh, I'll just read it to you. It says in 1 Thessalonians, it says uh, that we've been put in trust uh, with the gospel. I said, but we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak 
not as pleasing man, but God, which trieth our hearts. And so uh, he tells the Christians there, he says that uh, we've been put in trust with the gospel. So what are we to do? We're to speak it. We're to proclaim it. We're to tell it. God says, uh, it's our gospel. How come? Because we've heard it. It's our gospel because we've received it. We've accepted Christ as our Savior. But it's also our gospel because God's entrusted that message of salvation, that message of Christ to us so that we would then tell others who know not Christ the stewardship of the gospel is ours that we then need to pass on to others. So we see then, number one, uh, as we look at uh, uh, this thought of, of the gospel uh, being hidden, there are several ways that we see that the gospel is our gospel. It's ours because we've heard it. How shall they hear without a preacher? We've heard and uh, we've received it. But as we've received it, then give you power. But we got saved. We accepted Christ as our Savior. Now that we've heard it, now that we've received it, God says, all right, now I'm going to put you as a manager, as a, a steward, uh, as a, a, that which is entrusted to you. And it's your responsibility to make sure that those that you love, those that you care about, those are within your sphere of influence, those within your family, you take what I've entrusted to you and you make sure that they also can hear, to have the opportunity to receive, so they also then will be entrusted with that gospel. And that's where we see that um, progression that begins to take place. Now, how and when then is the gospel hidden? Look what the verse says. It says, Paul says, but if our gospel be hid, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now, what does he mean by this? Why is the gospel hid? The gospel is not hidden because it's complicated, uh, because it's really very simple. As simple as two plus two is, the gospel is very, very simple. In fact, the Bible says if you have faith uh, as a little child, he remember he said, suffer the little children. They were the disciples. They were, get these kids out of here. Get these kids out of here. And he said, oh, no, oh, no. Uh, if you had faith like these little ones, uh, suffer little, let the little guys come to me. Let the little kids come to me. Why? Because they have a faith, and their faith is what's going to allow them to obtain salvation, eternal life. He said, listen, you allow them to come unto me. The gospel message, it's not complicated. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge and wisdom under your, under your belt. All you need to do is have faith. It's simple. In fact, the more knowledgeable we become, the more complicated we make the gospel. But it's not because the gospel's complicated is because we've complicated it. Well, you got to do this and this and this and this and then don't do this and this and this and this and then maybe you'll be saved. No, that's not salvation. Salvation is you're a sinner. Because you're a sinner, you deserve hell. Jesus loves you and doesn't want you to go to hell. He died on the cross for you and all you have to do is trust Christ your Savior. Two plus two, that's four. Four things you got to understand. Four things you got to believe. Four things you have to receive. And once you do that, you become a child of God. It's not being a Baptist. It's not getting baptized. It's not turning over. It's not living a certain type of lifestyle. It's just receiving Christ as your Savior. Trusting Christ and His finished uh, sacrifice that He made for us on the cross as a means of salvation. But what's it mean when it says the gospel is hidden? Uh, if it's so simple, which it is, no education is needed to understand it. And yet it remains all fuzzy and unclear. Why is that? The Bible tells us why. Go back to our text verse back in 2 Corinthians. You'll know why uh, that we deal with such uh, delusions and deceptions and, and a mystery that's there. Uh, look what it says in chapter, chapter 4, verse 3, 2 Corinthians. We're still there. If our gospel be hid. I like that word if. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. All right, it doesn't have to be hidden, but if it is, all right, it says, it is hid to those that are lost, semicolon there, notice the continuation of the thought, in whom the God of this world, that's Satan, the God of this world, little g, of this world that blinded the minds of them which believe not. You see, the devil blinds them. He puts a veil uh, in front. Now, the gospel is not uh, uh, a veil. Uh, their minds are veiled to the gospel. Their minds are, are, are blinded to the gospel. And uh, who does that? The devil does that. And he does everything he can. And how does he do that? He veils them through what? Unbelief. Look at what the verse says. It says, that which believe not. How does he veil them? Don't believe in Jesus. Believe in your church membership. Don't believe in Jesus. Believe in your good deeds and good works. Don't believe in Jesus. Believe in your religious formalities and confirmations and baptism. Don't believe in Jesus. They blind their eyes to the fact of believing on Jesus. And so when there's unbelief that's present in someone's life, 
that unbelief is a result of Satan that's blinded their mind. And so let's not get mad at the person. Satan is a master deceiver. He's a master blindfolder. He's a master put up the veil and, and uh, to make us believe one thing uh, when it's not true and to believe something else about something that's true that's not uh, accurate of our interpretation of that. And so he says, uh, you, you've heard the gospel. You've received the gospel. I've entrusted the gospel to you. And as a result of that now, how does it deal with this thing where it says we're hid uh, of the gospel? Verse 3, because the devil puts a veil over their, their minds that blinds them so they cannot see and receive the truth. And that's why the verse goes on to say what? The light. Look at verse 4. They're blinded. All right. Their minds are blinded. Uh, they can't see. What? Less the light of the glorious gospel of Christ whose image of God should shine. And listen, that's our job. We're light bearers. That's our job. Let your light so shine before men and uh, don't put it on a bushel and cut, put the candle under a cover. Let's, let your light shine. Lighthouse Baptist Church, a beacon of hope in a city of darkness. Letting your light shine. Why? The light exposed the darkness and it reveals the blindness that's there. And if the light's not shining, then the blind... Uh, listen, the most difficult part of getting someone to know Christ as their Savior, to getting them saved, is to get them lost. Because everyone thinks they're saved. Because they're trusting in something. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm a good, you think you're going to heaven? Oh, yeah, I think so. How come? And they'll give you, you know, 18, the, the honor track that we've been using, 20 reasons why people think they're going to heaven. And all 20 of them are wrong. And other than trusting in Christ. And so there's a lot of things that we can trust in and believe in. And guess, guess what? They're good people. They're sincere people. They're just blinded. Then Satan has put a veil in their minds that they cannot see. They, they're unbelieving. And our job is to take the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to reveal the blindness that they have so they can know Christ as their Savior. That's a privilege, responsibility or uh, that we've been entrusted with to take the gospel to them. And so it's not complicated. The gospel is not hidden. Uh, the gospel is hidden from the minds of those that, uh, that d believe not or that don't believe. So this is why Satan is doing today. And his strategy today uh, is the mystery of Israel's blindness. Uh, the mystery of Israel's blindness. And that's demonstrating the fact of the Gentile blindness. Let me give you a verse here. Uh, just as a thought here, let me show you. Go to Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11. And uh, look with me down in a couple of verses here. We're talking about the blindness of Israel. Now, Here's what I mean by this. Uh, most people trust in Christ today as their Savior are Gentiles and not Jew. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And it doesn't matter what color skin you have. It doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. Uh, according to the Bible, you got, you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. And uh, the Jews, uh, Jesus came, the Bible said Jesus came unto his own. That was the Jews. And his own received him not. They heard the gospel, they saw the gospel, but they did not receive the gospel. And I'll tell you why they didn't receive the gospel. But listen, the greatest news that we have as Gentiles is because of them rejecting the Messiah. Then Christ in turn tuned his direction towards us as Gentiles. And now for all these many years, it's Gentiles that are trusting Christ as their Savior. And it's the Jews that have been blinded by Satan to prevent them from seeing Jesus as the Messiah. Even today... Uh, rarely will you see a Jew come to know Christ. There, there's many, there's some that'll get, we have, we've had some over the years that have gotten saved, but uh, it's a rarity. It's a rarity. Everyone, most everyone, 99% of folks getting saved today are Gentiles, uh, which means they're not a Jew. And so look at this verse here. We're talking about how Satan blinds the minds uh, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 call them the, the Israel's blindness. Romans chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest, now remember, Paul is writing to the Gentiles. He's the gospel of the Gentiles. Peter's taking the gospel to the Jews. The circumcision, remember the uncircumcision we just saw in the previous verse. So Paul's writing to the brethren there. So he's writing to the Gentiles. And he says, being of this mystery, lest you should be wise your own conceits, that blindness in part, no sound, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, this is the part we're at right now. Uh, you see, the, the nearness of our Lord's return is based upon when the fullness 
of the Gentiles is come in. When that last soul is saved, when that last Gentile comes into Christ and God allows the fullness of the Gentiles to take place, then at that moment, uh, then we see that the rapture of the church takes place and during that seven year tribulation, the Gentiles uh, that have not accepted Christ as Savior prior to that will be blind to the truth of what's going on and the Jews during the tribulation period, that seven year period of time, they will come to know Christ as their Savior. Why? Because the Jews require a sign. And there will be many signs and wonders during the tribulation that will then draw them to a place of once again come to that place of trust in Christ where they reject him the first time. And look what it says. There shall come out of Zion, the deliverer, still in Romans, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob is referencing the Jews. So Paul is saying, brethren, I don't, I don't want you to be ignorant of what? This mystery. A mystery is something that's not been revealed. Unless you should be wise in your own conceits and blindness. He said, listen, don't pride yourself and that you're getting saved and they're not. Don't think you're special because you're trusting Christ your Savior and the Jews aren't. He says, don't, don't get all cocky about it. It's because Satan is blinded, put a veil, a partial veil over the Jews where they will not see Christ as their Messiah. They won't see that. So when Jesus came to the earth, the Jews were looking for a king who would set up his kingdom. That's what they were looking for. Luke 17 tells us that. And they thought he would set up their kingdom during their lifetime. Acts chapter 1 tells that. When Jesus Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem four days before his crucifixion, they thought their king was coming up to set up the throne. Our kingdom is going to be set up and our Messiah is here. They were looking. They didn't see. See, prophecy was in the Old Testament. When they would look at prophecy, the prophets would only be able to see the mountain peaks of prophecy. And so it would be like me standing back here. And, and, and there's three different mountain peaks that I'm looking at. And I see this prophetic event. And I see that other prophetic event on the next mountain peak. And I see the next prophetic event on the third mountain peak. And as a result... Uh, then all I'm seeing is three uh, consecutive events taking place, right? But there's a valley of time between each mountain peak. And the prophets and those that are interpreting it many times did not see that gap between. And so the Jews thought, well, they saw that Jesus coming and he's setting up his kingdom and he's going to rule on his throne. They saw that as, as progressive events one after another. They didn't see the now over 2,000 years of, of gap between the, when he first came the first time to when he's going to come the second time. They didn't see that gap. So because they thought he was going to set up his kingdom and throne at that time, uh, soon they found out that he was not going to rule as their king at that time. And so they decided to reject him and they demanded him to be crucified. They saw him, but they were blind who he really was. They saw him. But they were blind who he really was. Matthew 13, 15 says, For the people's heart is wax gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. They saw, but they were blinded to what Jesus was or who he was. Their problem was unbelief. For he had believed Moses. Jesus said to them, For had you believed Moses, you would have believed in me. For he wrote uh, there in John chapter 5. And so we see the heresies and the false religions and all the cults today is Satan using all these different means and methods and modes to blind the eyes of those that see not Christ and their unbelief. And so our job that have become, we've heard the gospel, we've received the gospel, we've been entrusted with the gospel, our job now is to then begin to make sure that gospel is not hidden from them that know not the gospel of Christ. And so how then do we hide the gospel from others. Well, I think we first hide it from others when we fail to declare it. We fail to declare it. How guilty we are because we have the message. We heard it. We have received the message. And God has entrusted us with the message of the gospel, but we're not sharing it. We're not telling anybody about it. We're hiding it. We've got this wonderful truth of salvation. We've got this wonderful truth of forgiveness. We've got this wonderful message of hope and deliverance, good news. But we're not sharing it and we're not declaring it. There are people around us in our lives, in our worlds, from whom the gospel is hidden because we're hiding it from them. We're keeping it from them. We're not making it known to them. 
We're not speaking of God's love to them. We're not speaking of God's hope to them. Uh, we're, we've kept it a captive. We hide the gospel because we fail to declare uh, the gospel of hope to them. Listen, there's people, you, you, you know how frustrated you are. Uh, you just got saved and you come back to work and, and you're excited. Oh, yeah, man, trust in Christ. I say, oh, yeah, I've been a Christian for 28 years. What? 28 years we've worked together. 28 years we've been side to side. You, I never knew you are a Christian. I never knew you went to church. I never knew you were a follower of Christ. I never knew them. Those other undercover silent Christians why you hear the gospel from your co-workers you hear the gospel from your family we hear the gospel from our neighbors why we never just never declared it we never told anybody we hid it we were silent undercover behind the scenes we didn't want anybody to know that we were a Christian but we also hide the gospel when we fail not only to declare it but we fail to demonstrate it we're not only to speak the gospel, but we're also to live the gospel. Yes, we're to speak it, but we're also to live it. Remember the man in the tombs that was delivered from a demon a possession and, and, and uh, the maniac there, Gadara, and, and uh, Jesus came and healed them and took care of them. You know, Jesus told him to do two things. I want you to go home and tell and show what great, God, what great things God has done for you. I want you to go tell them. I want you to show them. Listen, God says the gospel uh, is hidden. How do we hide the gospel? We never declare it. We never share it. We never verbalize it. But also we never live it. Uh, we never live a life that uh, it demonstrates the gospel message. You see, the gospel is hidden by our inconsistent lives. Why would a pagan about uh, 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 serving alongside us or working alongside us, why would they desire the gospel uh, that doesn't change or transform our lives as a believer? Why should one become a Christian if it amounts to no more than church attendance? And it's occasionally on a Sunday while the rest of the week we live like the world we talk like the world we act like the world there's no demonstration that God has done something amazing something wonderful in our lives so we hide the gospel because we don't talk about it and we don't show it in our life that we live let me give you a verse here go to 1 Peter chapter uh, 3 and verse number 15 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 we hide the gospel from others by failing to demonstrate it in our lives. Now, I'm not uh, condoning lifestyle evangelism in replacement of verbalizing the gospel. The Bible says go in all the world and teach. That's verbalize, preach, that's teach. And, uh, but our life better be matching up what we're talking about and uh, we better be talking and that ought to give accountability how we're living our life. They ought to work together as two sides of uh, the same coin. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify, that word sanctify means set apart. Set apart. Say it apart what? The Lord God in your hearts. Boy, be ready always to give what? An answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You say, but preacher, nobody ever asked me any Bible questions. Nobody ever asked me to. I've never had to give an answer. Well, maybe that's because our attitude as a Christian and our life that's lived out, 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 out lived of our life does not raise a question uh, that would create a curiosity in the heart of an unbeliever. They ought to see something in my life and in your life that would create a curiosity say there's something different about your life. There's so, you've got hope in hopeless times. You, you're as upbeat and positive Positive. You always have a good outlook on life. What is it about you that makes you different? Listen, your life, your attitude, your goals, your dreams, something how you live your life ought to create questions. Has anyone ever asked you about the way you live and the attitudes you have and the way you live your life? If they're not asking you, then you're not demonstrating the gospel because if you're living the gospel, you're going to draw people out of curiosity and say, there's something. Why do you always act that way? Or why do you always dress that way? Or why do you always talk that way? Or why do you always behave that way? Or why do you always work so hard at the job? Or why do you always so respectful of the boss? Or why do you always so well, they're gonna ask you something? Why? You're living the gospel and it's gonna show forth. So it's because our testimony that people will ask questions. They want to know how we can explain the hope we have in a hopeless situation. There's no better time than this time in which we're living in the world to let your testimony, let your light shine. You know what? People are living in fear. 
People are living in a hopeless thing. I mean, you're hearing about the, the nuclear this and the inflation this and World War III this. And, I mean, the world, the world is bombarded with this. But listen, the child of God, it doesn't mean you walk around as though your head's in the ground, as though everything's you know, wonderful and hunky-dory. But listen, it's your faith and your hope in God and knowing the Word of God that you have a testimony that you go to your co-workers, your families, your friends, your neighbors, they watch you and there's something different about your life. As the whole world seems to be imploding, there's something in your life. Your life isn't imploding. It's flourishing. It's prospering. God has been good to you. And that creates some questions that require be ready always to give an answer. Be ready to give an answer. Because your life and the demonstration of the gospel being lived out in your life should create questions on those that we come in, from those we come in contact with. Live out the gospel. We need to sanctify Christ uh, in our thoughts, in our life, and God then will produce the change that takes place. I don't have to worry about producing change. I have to do the first part of 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. All I need to do is make sure that he is set apart first and foremost, preeminent in my life, and when I'm sanctifying Christ, he begins to do the change in my life. And that change produces questions that those you come in contact with are going to ask. There's something different about what what's what is it about you? The old cronies, the old buddies, the old folks you used to hang out with, they're gonna say to you all the time, you're no, you're no fun anymore. You're no fun anymore. Now, how they define fun, going out drinking, having a hangover the next night, or sleeping around, this and that, everything else, and all it's a, listen, that's not the, 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 the way fun. Listen, God offers something that's lasting. God offers something that's, that's real. God offers something that brings fulfillment in your hearts. And so he says, if our gospel be hid, how do, we, how do we hide it? When we fail to declare it, when we fail to demonstrate it, but also, I think, thirdly, when we fail to defend it, when we fail to defend it. Paul, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 16, let's look there. Philippians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul, in his letters, had a lot to say about the defense of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 16 Verse number 17. Philippians chapter 1, verse 16 said, The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Someone might say, Well, does the gospel even need defending? Does the gospel even need defending? Well, um, no, it doesn't. It stands alone, as we'll see here in a moment. But yet on another avenue or angle, at least according to the scripture, there is a part in another way that it does need defending. The true gospel is under attack. It's maligned. It's altered. It's watered down. It's adjusted. It's outright denied. And if we're not defending the gospel, then, uh, then all of these false religions and false ideologies and false beliefs are going to inundate and overwhelm and overcome uh, our, um, our, our, our city and our, our country. And so uh, we're to defend the gospel. But look what the Bible says in Jude 1, 3. It says, we earnestly contend for the faith. Uh, the situation on every hand calls for the defense of the gospel. And uh, the greatest defense of the gospel is a offense of the gospel and that's why much of the offense uh, of the gospel is offensive in the sense of it's on the offense Romans 1 16 says for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it it is a gospel it is the power of God unto salvation listen the gospel is described as a powerful explosive uh, 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 un unchangeable event uh, it's not some fragile thing that has to be protected it's not some real uh, uh, delicate thing that we have to defend listen the defense is that offense listen we want to barrel through the power of God is the gospel of God and God said listen the greatest way to defend the gospel is to boldly proclaim the gospel go on the offense and you become the defense of the gospel as you begin to offensively go forward with the truth and it begins to undermine the falsehoods that are out there. Paul is saying, I'm to, set, I'm to give a defense of the gospel. In Philippians 1.17, the word defense uh, in our Greek language means uh, comes from the word apologia. Apologia. It's a word that we get apologetics. Now, that's not a, we think on the surface apologia, we're to apologize for what we believe in. Apology. It sounds like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to apologize. Folks, I'm sorry, you know, I'm preaching the truth, but I'm sorry, you know. No, that's not what it's talking about. Apologetics 
is a legal term. It means the case is made by a defense attorney on behalf of a defendant under attack by a prosecutor. Paul's saying, I'm set to give an apologetic for the gospel, a logical, systematic, scientific, if necessary, defense of the gospel against all attacks of the adversaries. Listen, we've got to go on the offensive and be proactive in preaching the gospel. The apologetic is not apologizing for the truth of the gospel. It's moving forward with the gospel, like a bulldozer uh, moving forward. Here's an illustration, uh, illustrative story to help us understand uh, where I'm going. A famous doctor was dying. On his deathbed, the doctor turns to his son and tells him that I have found the cure uh, to your disease. And his son was dying of a disease. And, and he says, I finally found this cure to a disease. And he says, I want you to take this cure and I want you to be able to pass it on. I want you to share with everyone that you know. The doctor ended up dying and sure enough, the cure, that, that medicine did cure that son's disease and he was healthy as, as normal. But the son did not take the message that his father had given to him. He enjoyed the healing power of that medicine. He enjoyed the cure of his infirmity, but he never took that message. It died with him. The message of hope died with him. The message of, of uh, healing died with him. He never shared that, God, that healing message with anybody else. Sad to say to our shame, this is what we've done. We've received a wonderful spiritual healing through the gospel. We've received the forgiveness of sins. We've received a home in heaven. We've received a new purpose in which to live life. And we've had this wonderful message that's healed us and it's fixed our lives and it's gotten us on the right track and we were messed up and we were going the wrong way and our life was in turmoil but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ he got us on the right path in the right direction and doing the right things all because of the gospel but we, we were helped but we never saw the need to help anybody else we've hidden the gospel from those that need it so desperately we've taken the cure we've proved its benefit we should show the benefits of the gospel by our changed life and declare the secret with our lips to others, but we don't do it. We're told to defend the gospel, but the general picture is we need to go on the offensive of the gospel. Let me say, and I'm done. There's another important question in this verse. It says, for whom the gospel is hidden, who's it hid from? The word lost. It's hidden from those who are lost. That's a lost word today, the word lost. You don't hear it much in preaching anymore. It's a, good, it's a good Bible word. Jesus spoke of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He talked about the Son of Man has come to save that which is, was lost. In Luke 15, he says, Which of man, if you have a hundred sheep, and if you lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he found it? We may think a person is lost when they die and go to hell. We may think a person is lost when they enter eternity without Christ and they eternally are separated from God, lost in a place called hell. But may I tell all of us today that the Bible does not tell us that one day we will be lost. The Bible says that we are currently lost. If you're without Christ today, you are lost. That's how the Bible says he came to seek and to save. That's his lost. The Bible says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. If you're here today and you know not Christ your Savior, you're already under the wrath of God. You're already under the condemnation of God. You can try to live all the good deeds you want to do and change over, turn over a new leaf, but listen, you're under the condemnation of God. You're already lost, and you're blinded to the fact of your lostness and the purpose of you and I as a child of God to not hide the glorious light of the gospel from those we come in contact with. We've got to shine the truth and go on the offensive as we defend the gospel. They said there is a way of salvation. There is a hope of the future. There is a forgiveness of sins. You don't have to die and go to hell. The gospel is your only hope. Christ is the only way. And they're under the condemnation right now. If they die today without Christ, they're already lost. So you're not lost when someone dies and then go to heaven. It goes to hell. You're already, before I got saved, I was lost. I was blinded to my losses because the most difficult thing to do is to get someone lost. Because everyone thinks they're saved. You know how these fellas, when we're lost, 
And our wife says, you know where you're going? We don't say, I'm lost. I'm going to scenic route, right? And uh, we're going to scenic route. We're going to, wait, Dad, are we lost? No, we're not lost. And you may go 20, 30 miles out of your way and you're driving around. You're not lost. Why, it's so hard to admit that we're lost. How much more when Satan has blinded the minds of those that believe not? Hey, you, I'm not lost. I'm a good person. I'm not lost. I'm a church member. I'm not lost. I'm better than most. I'm not lost. I volunteer at charity and I give to charity. I'm not lost. I was baptized. I'm not lost. I turn over to new listen. You're, you're lost if you're without Christ. You're in the wrath of God. But when you come to know Christ, your Savior, you're no longer lost. That 99, that sheep, the one was lost, and he went and found him. The prodigal son came back, was lost, and now he is found. And so it may, as we look at this verse, he tells us that we're lost. This may refer to some of the loved ones in your family. Who in your family is lost? Lost. I've got them in my family. We all do. They're lost. Oh, they're good people, but they're lost without Christ. Oh, but they're, they, they're a good husband, but he's lost. He's a good parent. They're good grandparents, but they're lost. They're good kids. They're paying their bills. They're doing it. They're lost. Who is it in our families? Who is it in our, in our neighbors? Who is it in our coworkers? They're lost. They're lost without Christ. Who are they? Is it a grandfather? Is it a grandchild? They're lost. They're perishing. Folks, they're on their way to hell. And we've got a hope that we've got the only hope they have is a message of the gospel. And our Bible says their minds are blinded. There's a veil that's blinded. The God of this world has blinded them from the gospel. And our job is not to hide the gospel from that which has been hidden from them by the God of this world. Are you hiding the gospels from those who are lost. How negligent have we been. How criminal our silence has been. Today there may be some in hell today because I hid the gospel. You hid the gospel. You didn't tell them and today they're crying out I'm in hell. I'm burned in hell because no one told me the gospel. You say well they wouldn't have been interested anyway. That would have been their choice. Well, they wouldn't want what I got anyway. That's their choice. Our job is to shine the glorious gospel. Our job is to knock on that door. Our job is to give out a gospel track. Our job is to invite them to church. Our job is to give them the message of salvation. That's our job. What they do with the message, that's between them and God. But my job is to make sure I'm doing everything I can so they don't have to be lost. Here's a road map. You don't have to be lost. Here's a way. You don't have to be lost. How criminal it must be, our silence has been. Our lips closed when they should be open. Our lives inconsistent when they should be radiant of the beauty of God's holiness. You see, the prayer of intercession and the preaching of the gospel is what's going to allow that veil to be removed, that blindness to be removed. And so we've got people that we know. We need to begin to intercede on their behalf. Say, dear God, please, would you be merciful to them? They need you. They're, they're, they're obviously not seeing their need for you. They're living life and going forward as though everything's all right. But God, they need you. Please, Holy Spirit of God, would you just let them know their, their let them see their lost condition. Let them see their lost condition. Then, Lord, help me to have the courage and the boldness to be able to present the gospel to them. To get the gospel to them because they're lost without Christ. They're lost without Christ. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. You know, the Bible talks about in Ezekiel, it says that, those that we come in contact with, if we don't, if we hide the gospel from them, the Bible says their blood will be on our hands. Their blood. Because God has set us up as a watchman. And when the watchman's sleeping at his watch, there's a lot of hurt and damage and death and destruction that can happen. That's the purpose of watchmen. You're to watch. The bridge, watch the bridge, make sure it's okay, it's not washed out. And you got to watch and you're on guard, you're alert. Listen, you're the watchman, the point man. And if the watchman's not doing his job, then the blood of those that die and go off that bridge and those that die and go to hell, their blood will be on my hands and those blood will be on your hands because we didn't tell them. We didn't live the life that should have caused them to quit question to come towards us. It didn't give us the privilege to tell them the wonderful message of salvation. Who in your family, who in your sphere of influence is lost? And God has given you, then trusted you with a wonderful message of hope to that lost person. And they're just waiting for you 
to show them the way. They don't know they're lost. They don't know they're lost. The most difficult people to reach, Jesus told us this. The eye of a needle and the camel going through the eye of a needle. The most difficult people to reach with the gospel are those that are well-to-do. They're wealthy. Those that are materialistic. Those that have a lot of stuff. Because they don't see, they don't see their need for God. They see church as a crutch. They see God as, a, as sort of a, a cane that we limp upon. And uh, they see God as sort of an escape goat. Uh, they don't see their need for the gospel. You spy, uh, listen, you, you pick, a, pick some ritzy area of town and take two hours and knock on doors. Tell me what kind of response you get. Now, they still need to hear. But tell me the response you'll get. They don't need God. They got the this and that and these cars and these boats and these this and this, that. And that. They got all the stuff they think they... They're trying to fill up their life with all this stuff to give them security and strength. And that's why Jesus says, go the highways, the hedges, the byways. Go out, just out and about, just, just where people are living. And he says, compel them to come from my house. I want to be filled. And you go out there and you find someone that realizes, boy, I don't, I don't deserve a Savior. I've messed up. Boy, I, I've, I've done bad, and, and my, my marriage is, is destroyed, and my kids are this, and I've done this, and I'm here. And all of a sudden, they, re, they don't think they, they could, God would even want them. God said, no, he, he wants you. God wants everybody, but it's our job. And it's your job. There's people in your life, there's people in my life, I've been hiding the gospel from them. I've been hiding the gospel. And God said, if it's hid, it's not going to affect, I'm still going to heaven. The effect is going to be on those that are lost. And God has entrusted you and me with a sphere of influence of people that are in your life. Will you recognize the responsibility to say, you know what? I'm working this job around a lot of lost people. Hey, that's your mission field. I'm living in a neighborhood, there's a lot of lost people. That's our mission field. My family, boy, there are a lot of lost. That's your mission field. They're lost. We're found. We're not lost. We know the way. We know the way to happiness. We know the way to satisfaction. Let's not be a silent witness. Let's not be an undercover Christian. Let's be proud to let others know, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Don't be that one that said, You've been a Christian all, we've worked all these years together, and you never, I never knew you were a Christian. Shame on us. Shame on us that they never knew we were a Christian. They never knew. There was nothing about us that made us different than anybody else. Like, I never knew that. Why didn't they? Because we were hiding it. Father, help us this morning. We're all, we're all guilty as charged.